Welcome to the Cardinal Zone podcast. We're taping this on a Thursday afternoon. Uh, I'm Jake Powers, and I'm here with a variety of Cardinal writers. Hi, I'm Zach Rastel. Andrew Tucker. Matt Schregesser. Tommy Valton Irwin. Lauren Cox. All right, we'll kick things off talking about last weekend's football game. Big win over Rutgers, and obviously the big story of the game was the return of Corey Clement. What are you guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, Corey, he looked great for... Everything but about five yards, where he got caught four yards short of the end zone. Uh, you know, he, you could tell he was kind of still hampered. He's, you know, still coming back. So don't expect, you know, 100% Corey Clement for the next couple weeks. But 90% Corey Clement is still better than anything we were putting out before. I, I went back through and rewatched all 11 of Corey Clement's runs. And I have to say, I came away less impressed on the second time through. I felt like there were only two or three runs where it was like actually like, wow, Corey Clement made a play. Where, you know, he had quite a few that was like two yards, three yards, five yards. No, and I, I sit there and I watch those runs and I think, well, Daria Gunwale would have got those five yards. Taiwan Dew would have got those five yards. But then you look at like the the big run where he got chased behind. That was a play where he was patient. He waited for his blocks. And this kind of thing where Daria Gunwale or Ty- Taiwan Dew, they get a little ahead of themselves and they're trying to get downfield. But Corey waits to the last second and then makes a cut. And there was even a run where. He made a cut, and he needed to make one more cut, and he probably would have had another big breakoff, but he wasn't. He didn't quite read. He didn't quite get all the way back inside, and that's the kind of thing I think once he's back in shape, once he's back in full game mentality, then you'll probably start to see him break off a few more because he got close on another play, and it ended up being only like eight or nine yards instead of what could have been 60. And you have to keep it in perspective. I mean, his return was against a Rutgers defense, which in retrospect was probably the ideal situation to reintroduce him when he's not going against a defense that you know, is known for getting in the backfield and creating a lot of penetration. And, um, you know, he said the biggest issue that he struggled with on Saturday was staying loose and staying warm, and that's what you mentioned, Lauren, a product of not quite being in that sort of game shape that he's used to being in, you know, come week 10. And, you know, I talked to, uh, uh, I think it was Joe Rudolph this week. That's, or no, no, you know, his running backs coach, John Settle, and he, I asked him about, you know, how, if they want, how much they wanted to limit Corey Clement's snaps this week. And I said, you know, are you hesitant to put him out there in pass protection because you know you don't want to overuse him? He's like, you know, actually, Corey came up to me and he's like, man, can you let me get out there in the pass game? Because I think that's how I can get my pads behind me and really get underneath him and get back to the thing. So his first play out there was a pass play, and he said they were, they were trying to get him in as much as they could, but they didn't want to overdo him, especially in that first week. Speaking of, you know, getting warm, I assume that it's going to be uh, be nicer in Maryland than it is here. It's been kind of kind of cold the last couple games, but the last few days have been warm, but uh, I'm sure we could ask our uh, D.C. native Tommy more about the uh, the Maryland weather later, but uh, I think that, you know, being warm shouldn't be an issue for him uh, for him this week. Um, Dare has been named the starter for this week. Does that surprise you guys at all? Not really. I don't think they want to rush Corey back and have him do any more than he's ready to do. I don't think he's going to be at 100% still. I think I think he was probably in worse shape than he thought or Paul Chris thought coming into this week, and I, I think it was a little bit of a wake-up call for him. They're like, holy crap, I can't keep up on this run. It almost looked like he pulled something or a little bit, but I think... On the long run? On the long run, yeah. Line, yeah he, he pulls up. Just I mean, there's mm-hmm. a moment in the run where for you sure. see him pull up, and, and that was a little bit concerning, but it sounds like there's no there's no injury concern there and nothing, and he should be at the same level that they anticipated him in his recovery, so... I'm not surprised they're going to go with Dari first and then kind of work Corey back in like last week. Yeah, on Monday, said, on Monday Corey actually said that he did let up on that run. He was looking at the Jumbotron hoping that there wouldn't be white jerseys behind him, and, and that's he said that was something he was surprised about. He's never said he's not a person who's been caught before, which is kind of funny. But, um, yeah, we have to keep in mind that he's only taken, at this point, he's taken 27 carries this entire season. Like it's, I think it was made out to be a huge comeback for him last game, and he, he was handed the ball 11 times, and I think that... That's something important to keep in mind, that he's, he's still not getting those game reps yet. He's still not quite in the right shape to be the starter. Uh, what should we expect this weekend for the offense against Maryland? Maryland's defense is pretty bad again, um, but they do have a pretty strong defensive line. I know that uh, number seven, I, there's no way I will ever be able to pronounce his name correctly, um, he absolutely dominates. He has, I think, nine and a half or ten sacks, depending on you know what, what website you're looking at. But, you know, he consistently gets past the offensive line and he gets to the quarterback, which will be difficult for, for Joel Stave and this young UW offense, offensive line. I'm going to take a stab at his name right here. Let me see if this is right. Yannick Gaku? Is that close? Do you think uh, the silent end at the name? What's, how do you spell that? N- N-G-A-K-O-U-E. Uh, There's a lot of vowels in there, I but not in the right spot. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Do you have something to say, Lauren? <laughs> Yeah, you know, they also have some some pretty good talented linebacker, and I think their their front seven is something that I think is going to challenge the Wisconsin run offense again and try and 
we're you know it'll be interesting to see if Corey Clement can break away from a few more again because I think you're going to see another average yards per carry output from from Dare unless unless he's really starting to learn more from Corey. It's not that Dare does anything wrong; it's just that he's not quite at that level. So I think it's going to be another one of those Joel Stave throws thirty plus times. And the Badgers' offense is just better than the Maryland defense because I think their secondary doesn't quite match up with the Badgers' pass catchers. That's what it came down to last week, too, with, with Stave throwing. Again, they leaned on him pretty heavily, and he was able to get away with a lot of things that you can't get away with in, in a lot of different situations. Obviously, he had the really, really bad interception later on. But, I mean, one player that comes to mind is the fourth and seventh pass to Alex Erickson that ended up going for a touchdown. I mean, you run a, you know, on fourth down, that is going to Erickson. He runs a drag across the middle, and there's no one there who picks him up in zone coverage. That just doesn't make any sense, and that doesn't happen with normal secondaries. So Yeah, but also credit to Erickson on that. He, uh, he, I talked to him after the game, and he was telling me, you know, you know, he read it, he read it, and then he made sure he you know, did the move you know, right in the right places. And he did. He made the defender fall down, which shows poor defensive you know, footwork and whatnot. But it also credits to the wide receiver for, for putting the defense in that situation. What about the Maryland offense? What should we expect out of them? Not a lot. I mean, their offensive line's not very good, and so I think you're going to see Schobert finally put up another sack. I think it's been a couple weeks since he's put one on the board. I think it's been four or five weeks. Yeah, it's been. It's, yeah, he hasn't put one up since he took the national lead. So I mean, he's remained there. So I think you'll see he and Beagle get off the quarterback pretty good, and then the receiving core is not great either. So I think you'll see kind of Soldier and Darius just put on man coverage against these guys for most of the game and just kind of shut them down and make the quarterback beat them, which probably won't happen. Although the sacks aren't there, Wisconsin's still getting a ton of pressure on the quarterback. That was something that was evident at Illinois, and it was evident last week, too. I mean, sacks aren't the only stat that measure, you know, where what sort of pressure you're getting in the offense and how you're sort of detracting from what the quarterback can do by, you know, applying pressure and, and getting them uncomfortable. Uh, would you expect the result of this game to be closer to what we saw against Rutgers or maybe early on in Big Ten play where they, they really weren't blowing anyone out? I'd say it'll be much closer to Rutgers. Maryland and Rutgers are both, you know, pretty bottom of the barrel in terms of the Big Ten. I don't think Maryland has, do they have maybe one Big Ten win? One or zero? Um, so it's, you know, they do have zero. They are, you know, very mediocre team overall, and compared to other Big Ten teams, they just don't measure up. I think it'll be a lot like last week where it's kind of close for the first quarter, maybe maybe first half, and you're kind of like, oh, you know, is this going to be a close game then? And then it's like third quarter, the kind of offense makes adjustments, the defense makes adjustments, and boom, you finish like you know, the more blow. It almost happens even before you even notice it. I mean, Wisconsin always starts that way kind of slow, and it seems like they're able to sort of gradually build it up, and before you know it, they're up by 30. So I, I think that'll be the same case this week. All right, uh, well, now sh- we'll shift focus over to men's basketball. Last night, the uh, Badgers in an exhibition game beat UW River Falls quite handily. A lot of new faces for the Badgers with Decker, Kaminsky, Jackson, Duke, and uh, Goss are all gone. Uh, so, Tommy, Tommy and Matt, what were your thoughts on last night's game? Yeah, it was good to see um, all the young guys get in the game. Everybody that was active for the Badgers got into the game and played at least you know five or six minutes. So, it was good to see a lot of those young guys uh, get some court action at the Cole Center so you can see how they've learned from those older guys so they can start to step into the, the blank spots that are left by big guys that left. Right, and another thing I have to add on is uh, just the play of Ethan Happ. Uh, he was almost forgotten last year. I know he redshirted, but he tore up the uh, game last night. I think he had a double-double. He looked really confident in the paint as well. Um, I think he's going to be a huge asset for the Badgers this year and can fill maybe even a void of Sam Decker in terms of uh, points per game. Yeah, I think that's Happ's definitely a guy that they're going to look to. <clears throat> a lot of people have pegged as who might have a breakout year for the Badgers. They obviously need production from somebody with so many good guys gone. <clears throat> you also have, obviously, Nigel Hayes will be expected to play a bigger role. Them Koenig as well. But um, what about guys like B- Vito Brown and Zach Showalter? Where do, they're into the starting rotation now. There's not a whole lot of depth there at center when talking about Brown, uh, which we expect out of them. Yeah, uh, Vito Brown really didn't wow me uh, in the game against River Falls. You know, he's he has a lot of trouble scoring the basketball. He's pretty solid defensively, but... On the on the offenses end, he's pretty close to a nothing, which yeah, is but which is not ideal. He did make a three. Surprised did make a three. I didn't know that was in his arsenal. And then he blew their streak by missing a three in uh, early in the second half. So yeah. oh, actually, yes, was well, second half they went three three of fourteen. First three of 14. half was six of six. Um, Showalter, I mean, that's obviously kind of the same concern for him as on offense. You know what he can be defensively, pretty much the equal, if not better, than Gosser, which is saying something. But offensively, not quite sure what's there. I mean. 
you saw flashes of potential of what he could do. Like I said, he had a nice steal and a breakaway, which Badgers rarely or if ever get. But of course, he missed the dunk. Who's the dunk? Yeah. So All American rim grabber. Yeah, it was. Uh, I haven't seen a replay of it. Like at first glance, I don't know what it looked like to you guys. It looked like when he was going up, he kind of like hesitated. Did he want to lay in or dunk? And last second, decided to try to dunk, and it didn't work out. From from my perspective in the student section, which is very a very different one, I had it kind of straight on on yeah. the angle. To me, it looked like he went, he jumped full on, he was full fully committed, and I think he just, just he just rimmed out. I think it was just unfortunate for him. That's rough. And I mean, obviously, that's you only want to put so much stock into a game that's against UW River Falls, a D three opponent. But it, they took care of their business, got a lot of new guys, and there's no reason to feel any worse off about their about them after that game, which is pretty much, I guess, all you could ask for after a D3 game. Hey, St. John's lost to a Division II opponent in an exhibition game by, I think, I want to say 30-plus points. Was Maybe it might much? have been 25 Jeez. points. But I think it's 32. 32. Oh, so, so hey, crazy. don't don't take it for granted. At, at least we're not St. John's. Yeah, and it was good to see some things that we didn't see last season, you know, whether or not it's against River Falls. Uh, their coach talked about after the game, they're one of the more physical teams at WIAC. And so it was good to see... Guys grabbing a lot of rebounds, you know, they dominated the the rebound, yeah, that's... the rebound game, and uh, that was something that they struggled with last year in Big Ten play. They were something like tenth of the Big Ten in rebounds per game, despite having two of the best big guys in the league. So it's good to see guys like Charlie Thomas, Nigel Hayes still getting involved, uh, Ethan Happ on the boards. Another thing I have to add is uh, just it's kind of uh, uncharacteristic of the Badgers to commit as many turnovers and fouls mm-hmm. as they did last night. I know there's a lot of young guys in the uh, season opener. Um, but I think it's something that they need to address before, you know, a tough uh, non-conference schedule approaches. First, yeah, for sure. In the first half, they had eight turnovers, I believe, which is typically what a Bo Ryan team averages for an entire game. So that was a bit surprising. And then the refs were just calling everything last night. So you don't know if that will kind of change during the season. Typically, you know, it's, they don't call any fouls on Bo Ryan teams. But uh, one notable face missing was Andy Van Vliet, who is currently out with an eligibility issue. Um... We don't know much about it at the time. It's just there's when a player is done with high school from when they graduate or their expected graduated date, they have a one year window to enroll in a university, and they get a year knocked off of eligibility knocked off that if they play you know amateur basketball. And apparently he did do that. There's not being quite specific on it so far. They're just saying that there was basically like circumstances beyond his control that caused it, and so they'll go through the appeal process, I guess. They'll be probably decided within a couple of weeks, and then either he'll get to play this year or he'll be out for the year, and then he'll be back next year as a sophomore. So he will be back, as as far as we currently know, because <laughs> I, I know that yesterday there was a lot of uh, a lot of up in the air about whether it, it will deny him eligibility to- in, in general no, or if he he'll, will be back. He'll be back for certain, but like if his, he does not win his appeal, he'll be back next year. He'll essentially, well kind of pretty much redshirt this year, only if he doesn't get to save a year of eligibility. Yeah, what's striking about the whole situation is just the timing of it, and that's something that mm-hmm. we're looking into actively, Zach is looking into. Um, yeah. I Just the fact that the Wisconsin, you know, applied for that waiver and that, you know, there wasn't a response from the NCAA until, mm-hmm. what was it, three hours before the game yesterday, yeah. I mean. And actually, I like, about an hour and a half ago, I was on the phone with a former compliance officer for the NCAA, and I asked him about that, like, is this typical for this to take this long? And he said it kind of is because it's a fairly long process because they have to get in contact with all these people overseas and try to figure out, you know, what exactly, what he played, uh, if it counts as organized competition, and, like, the criteria for that is there's a lot to it. There's If there's officials, some of the things are if an official score is kept, if it's scheduled, publicized in advance, if team uniforms are news, are used, admission is charged. It's it's kind of, there's a lot of things that go into it, and I guess it's tough to say what his chances are of winning the appeal when nobody really knows that much of the details. What sort of vibe did you guys get, I guess, from the team in response to Van Vliet? Um, There wasn't, nobody really asked the players about it. Bo was the only one asked about it, and he just kind of said, We've known that this might be an issue all along. I mean, I think every they said that pretty much everybody did, but that didn't stop anybody from recruiting him. And just that they'll kind of see how it plays out. He did uh, give props to the student section for chanting "Free Van Fleet," though. So, and he said he couldn't say it three times fast. So now we know a lot about uh, Bo Ryan's pronunciation skills. He's a basketball coach, not a broadcaster. 
All I'll say <clears throat> is that it's ironic that the Belgium is the one that's waffling on his eligibility. <laughs> <God damn it>. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you think. As, as soon as you started talking, I knew nothing good was going to happen. <laughs> hey, my ex-girlfriend matches him on Tinder, so like that's a thing. Is too. that actually that's yeah, a thing? Yeah, I can get, I can get the, the hookup. I mean, not that kind of hookup. <laughs> 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 I can't think of no better trades. Grand Slam breakfast. <laughs> Several big games this week. Uh, we'll go around, have you guys make picks. Notre Dame, definitely. Pittsburgh's a good team, not good enough to beat Notre Dame. Totally agree. Uh, they underperformed against North Carolina uh, last week. I just don't see them winning. Yeah, I think Notre Dame's a big favorite in this game, but I think Pitt will make it a little closer than people are expecting, and I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Uh, barring a, a horrible game from Baylor tonight to see Baylor jump Notre Dame in the college football playoff standings. Yeah, I think it'll be tighter just with uh, Notre Dame being on the road, but I, I, this is all Irish. Notre Dame. All right. Uh, our second game, number six, Florida State at 7-1, and one, taking on Clemson, who has been ranked number one in the first college football playoff rankings of the year. Clemson's a fantastic team, and Florida State is pretty good, but I don't think that they can match up with Clemson. Totally agree. Uh, once again, Clemson playing at home. Death Valley is a tough place to play in. I don't see uh, Florida State coming up. Yeah, this one feels like the blowout of the week to me. Clemson's pretty good. Yeah, Florida State doesn't stand a chance. Yeah, uh, Everett Golston is hashtag good, but Florida doesn't quite have enough talent around him on the offense, so I'd, I'd, have, to go with, I'd have to go with Clemson there. Okay. Uh, third game, we have number eight TCU. They're undefeated at 8 No, I mean, they're all the way down at number eight in the college football playoff rankings. You know, I don't think they've impressed many people. They've won all their games, but they're kind of in that same boat as Michigan State. They're winning, but not by a lot. They'll be traveling to Stillwater to take on number 14, Oklahoma State. I, I have Oklahoma State in this one. I think that being at home, the two teams are pretty evenly matched, but I think being at home is definitely the more more important factor. I have to uh, disagree. I think TCU will come up big here. Boykin is a phenomenal athlete. I just think he will uh, carry the team in this one. Yeah, I'm with Andrew on this one. Uh, I think Oklahoma State's going to win by three to seven points. Trevon Boykin could have 200 rushing yards, and it won't make up for it. I'm going with Oklahoma State on this one. I like Boykin a lot. I mean, not, not as much as a passer as a runner, but I'm definitely, I, I definitely think he's going to carry this TCU offense pretty well, and I think, I think their defense will be able to hold up just enough. All right, so then last game, the big game of the week, a lot at stake in this one, uh, is more or less the SEC West Championship game. And, I mean, there's a good chance that whoever wins this game is going to end up in the college football playoff. Number two, LSU traveling to Tuscaloosa to take on number four, Alabama. I think I think LSU should be able to win this. Um, it is at home for Alabama, but Alabama lost at home earlier this year against Ole Miss, who is by no means the team LSU is. So give me LSU in this one. Yeah, I think this matchup comes down to the uh, rushing attacks on both teams. Obviously, you have uh, Fournette on LSU and Derrick Henry on Alabama. I just think Alabama's defense is going to contain Burnett, and Alabama should win. Yeah, I'm a big fan of this LSU team with uh, Herschel Walker over there playing for their for them at running back, but I think the uh, playing at home is too big for Alabama to drop this one. No, I don't think Herschel can be contained right now. I'm going LSU. I'm also going to go LSU. I just feel like I wish I were a little bit more confident in their offensive line going into against Alabama, but Leonard Fournette is something special, and I don't think they, they can stop him in Alabama. And, I mean, that's, obviously the college football rankings don't mean that much right now very early in the season, but that top four, you have Clemson, LSU, uh, Ohio State, and Bama. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts on those four being in and you know, maybe other things you saw in the rankings? Well, you know, people online and on Twitter and all that were freaking out, oh, two SEC teams, what's going on? But they forget that last year's first ranking had three SEC teams. So, you know, there will be four teams from four different conferences by the time, or independent in the case of Notre Dame, but there will be... Four teams and no conference will have two player or two teams in the uh, in the playoff. And I mean, it's obviously with LSU Alabama playing this weekend. That's issue is just going to kind of sort itself out. Pretty yeah, although although hey, if, if, if Alabama wins, LSU might move up a couple spots because that's a quality loss right there. That's true. Uh, yeah, I think uh, one of those SEC teams is going to drop out after this game, and I think the next team in. It obviously could either be Notre Dame, but depending on how Baylor plays without uh, Seth Russell, they could be the team to watch. Was anybody surprised to see Notre Dame up so high at number five at seven to yes. one? I mean, that's they have their one loss. They've lost a couple. Of, they're starting quarterback and starting running back begin the year, and they have a, a few close wins like against teams like Virginia. Yeah, they have an embarrassing win against Virginia. Their their one loss though was to the number one team, so it's not like yeah. their their loss is to you know Virginia Tech like Ohio State last year who made the playoff. 
That's true. And at the end of the day, I mean, releasing rankings at this point in the yeah, season really doesn't mean a whole lot. It's, it's kind of just to, it's, to do exactly this. Yeah, it's for people stuff. like us to blab on about it. Yeah. I mean, because like last last year, the first rankings, Ohio State was at number sixteen. It's, well, on TCU being this low, <laughs> <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, Trevor Boykin is so good. Have you ever watched him play? He's going to never in the top four. You just watch. Florida <laughs> spoke. Yeah. Baylor's too damn low, too. I just hate this ranking. I just think it'd be interesting to see how or how, or if um, Ohio State keeps their uh, spot in the top four. Uh, obviously, uh, JT Barrett is suspended. Um, I don't know if Cardell Jones can play up um, to what he's been expected to play up to. Um, I just don't know how they'll finish. Urban Meyer always finds a way. I'm not at this point. You know, Ohio State's been kind of shaky, but and they're they're still undefeated. They're still rolling through everyone. I'm not worried about Ohio State. And, and unless anything changes, Bears will be back for their big games against Michigan State and Michigan. So it's a conveniently timed by. Yeah, that's all. Uh, I mean, just a convenient one week suspension. Thank I'm gonna, God. I'm going to throw out this take. I think Cardell Jones is better than JT Barrett. Oof. Oh boy, has a brighter NFL future. How about that? Okay, How about that? maybe that's, not better. Yeah, right so, now. okay. I'm, I, I, would, I won't dispute that. that. Brighter as, NFL future. How about that? As as far as you know, who should be starting for them? I think Barrett's made quite clear that he should be. I, I'm not going to speak to that because you know, I really don't know. I'll tell you this though: if Cardell Jones gets injured this week and Braxton Miller has to step up, they'll have another third string quarterback starting. That's true. The third string quarterback that was the first string quarterback that started all the doubts last year. This gets come full circle. More and more fun. <laughs> it's like the Badgers all quarterback receiving core that they can throw out there with Alex Erickson, DJ Gills, and Tanner McAvoy, all former quarterbacks. That, that all comes back. It's fun stuff. Oh, so this has been <laughs> this week's edition of the Cardinal, the Cardinal Zone podcast. Thank you for listening and tune in next week. Thanks. <laughs>